Okay, Susan, welcome. Hey, Eric, so good to be here. I know, we had a little chit chat before we got on here with a whole bunch of stuff that people would probably find super, super interesting. But first, I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, we've become friends and uh, we kind of had, in my opinion, a, a, a quick connection. Um, totally. on a level that you don't always get with people. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of love in this heart for you. And gotcha. thank you. And um, why don't we start off by um, letting people know who is Susan? Uh, <laughs> my life has changed so much in the last four years. It's hard to even answer that question. You know, I'm, um, I'm a recovering addict. Um, I'm a recovering food addict. Uh, I'm a mom. I'm now the leader of a worldwide movement that is really changing the face of food addiction and obesity and weight loss. Uh, I'm a scientist. Um, I'm a wife. Um, I'm a friend. And um, yeah, I've really dedicated my life, like my whole life lately makes sense in light of this bright line eating thing that's happened over the last four years. Um, you know, I had a life before that. I was actually, a, I had a full life. I was a tenured professor and things were tootling along. Um, but uh, then this whole thing started. I mean, it's, I mean, it's kind of a long story. You want, you want the story? And not the long, long version of the story, but it's a story. Um, well, that was really good. Yeah. So, so tell us the story of, you know, the path where you were and you talk a lot about, you know, who you were in your 20s and your, you talk about your resume, so to speak. But yeah. what, what, what about your life has brought you to where you are right now? Why, why is Brightline eating the folk? And, and you say four years, and that just is astounding to me. Because where you've come from to where you are right now is, is really a 180. I don't even know if you can call it a 180. It's a total transformation, right? Yeah, well, yeah, four years. It has been four years. And, you know, we, Brightline Eating is the movement or the whatever i hate to call it a business because i don't I, I don't relate to that term really but um it's the organization i guess the movement that's grown the fastest in the online space that faster than anybody's ever seen um mm -hmm. a thing like this you know there's this new phenomenon of like you know a bunch of people online doing something a certain way and you know it's a movement and um and ours has like yeah it's only been four years which is ridiculous given the size of it now um and, you know, the seeds of it go way back for me. Like my whole life makes sense in light of, I think I already said that, but in light of this now, you know, it puts everything into perspective. Um, I, lots of things I don't usually share. Like for example, that I was an actress when I was a little kid. A lot of people don't know that um, mm -hmm. on stage. And I gave up my acting career at the age of about 12 because I got too heavy. Mm -hmm. And, um, that sounds so, there's so many things wrong with that statement, right? I gave up my acting career at 12 because I was too heavy. Right. Yeah, it's wrong on all sides. I agree. <laughs> you know, and it wasn't an explicit thing to me. I kind of sensed, I knew as I was coming into puberty, um, I hit puberty at 13, but as, as it was happening, um, I, yeah, I just knew that being fat um my odds of making it mm -hmm. were really compromised and um i was scared of mm -hmm. that of traveling that road and i was at the point with my stage acting career where i either had to quit school and do it full-time professionally or it, like it, the path you know i'd already starred in major plays on stage i'd kind of done everything you could do bef without going pro and i was getting straight a's in school so i was i was and i was liking school so i was hesitant to like stop going to school um and the fact that i was now too heavy to play leading roles well and you know what i mean so well yeah um, sure that would be traumatic yeah anyway so i don't usually tell that but anyway so i was hmm. heavy as a kid you know at the age of 12, I weighed significantly more than I weigh now. Um, and, um, and it got worse. When I was 14, I did my first drug. And um, not only did I have an amazing time, as psychedelics can be sometimes, but um, I lost seven pounds that night. And um, mm -hmm. my little 14-year-old, you know, universe 
tilted on its axis. Solution. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, I don't know, kind of worked, I guess. I don't know, in the way that drugs and alcohol can kind of work for a while. Um, lots of fun and lots of out there experiences. And, and my weight was um, kept within a range. I mean, heavier than I am now, always. But um, not obese, you know, like in a range um, for a while. But the drugs got worse because I found crystal meth, which is like the best weight control drug in the world. And for a hot, I, I don't know, maybe for five seconds, I got down to the weight I am now, maybe on that drug. But that came with drug-induced psychosis and dropping out of high school and spiraling out of control. And then I quit that, but on my own. But mm. then I picked up cocaine and then I learned how to freebase it. And that led to a crack cocaine addiction. Um, I became a prostitute um, for a while, didn't really have an address, um, quite mm. a few, like several months, didn't have an address um, and made a lot of money, you know, uh, you know, as a call girl and financed the party. Like, you know, at the end there, it was getting really dark, but I still had cash in my pocket and I was kind of holding on to some kind of something. And um, I had a moment of clarity in a crack house just a few days after my 20th birthday. And um, I had a blonde wig on my head. My head was shaved, but I was wearing wigs um, to work. And um, it was ugly, Eric. And um, I had a moment, it was like a Tuesday morning. It wasn't like a Tuesday morning. It actually was a Tuesday morning. And I'd been there for days. And um, I had this moment where the universe just cracks open. It happens for some of us. And we get just this clarity. And not just clarity, but clarity with movement in it. And the movement was, you gotta get out of here right now, or this is all you're ever gonna be. Mm. And it was clear as day. Not you're gonna die, you're gonna keep living, and this is all you're ever gonna be. And I, you know, I had dreams of going to Harvard. And you know, here I was a high school drop, dropout, crack addict, prostitute. Like that wasn't the resume that I imagined for myself. And so I got out of there. Um, I had no, idea how to really transform my life, but I got taken to um, a 12-step meeting for alcohol and drug addiction on a first date that night. It's just the craziest story ever. Like this guy- That was your date? It wasn't planned? No, it, this dude, I met him at a, at a gas station at three in the morning earlier that week. And um, he's like, you want to go to a meeting? And I didn't even know what he was talking about, Eric. I was like, sure. I thought, to me, meeting meant business people sitting around a boardroom table. So I thought he had a meeting that he had to be at and then we were going to go party. And we got there and he's like, you can come in, like, let's go. And um, it was at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco in the basement of Grace Cathedral, like one of the most glorious cathedrals in the Western Hemisphere. Wow. And we went down into the basement through the plumes of smoke and everyone's like, welcome. You know, and I'm like, what is this? And where are we? But I'd had my moment of clarity that morning. And um so you were open to it. I got a 24 hour coin and I haven't had a drink or a drug since. Yeah. 24 That's years. Amazing. That is amazing. Years. Yeah. And then I got fat. Of course. Like I just started packing in the food. I knew it was going to happen. Like I, I already knew myself with food well enough to know like, Oh, without the drugs, like holding this in check, like, Oh, it's and, and you know, <laughs> um, and it was all right at first. Like, I was just so relieved to be out of the, um, you know, the intensity of that dark underworld. Um, and I enrolled in community college and I got a job at a movie theater selling popcorn and got a legitimate life. Moved back in with my mom. Never went back to tricking. Um, and, um, I, you know, I rocked community college, transferred to UC Berkeley, got straight A's there, spoke at the graduation. But like, you know, I was like mainlining marshmallows and, and Mrs. Fields cookies at UC Berkeley. Like I would stuff my coat pockets. Mainlining marshmallows. I was, I was walking across the campus. Like I needed a steady drip of sugar. Like I couldn't really go honestly, like five minutes without sugar. So I would- Was that, was that just for you to feel kind of normal? Just yeah. so that your brain had that- just to not shake. Mm -hmm. Just to not like seize out. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's how addicted to sugar I was. And, um, and I'd go, I'd go to, you know, 12 step food meetings and, you know, but 
at the time, the meetings that I was, the, the 12 step food world is really varied. And I, 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 I was a daily meeting attender in a variety of different 12 step food programs for 20 years. I know the landscape of that world really well. And just to say respect, a mm -hmm. lot of people are getting a lot of recovery there. And um, I'm a big fan of support that works mm -hmm. wherever you get it from. Um, I sometimes got what I needed and I sometimes didn't. Like it was sort of like, it wasn't like the drug and alcohol, like don't drink, don't use, you know, I'll see you at the next meeting, do you need a ride? It was sort of like, well, at the meeting that I went to for food, it was sort of like, well, you know, you get to pick your definition of abstinence, find a sponsor who has what you want. And, um, and I was kind of like, I didn't, I didn't quite, even though I had a few months already clean and sober, that lingo didn't quite, I didn't quite. Hard to interpret. It. Yeah. So I didn't really know what to do with my food and that, you know, eight years in that program. And then I got found a more rigorous program that did work. Um, but, and that's where I, where I lost my weight. That was in 2003. And again, respect, like so grateful, so mm -hmm. grateful for the 11 years I spent in that program, like really getting love and support on a daily basis. And, you know, um, my husband left me during that time because of that program. He was like, um, the rigidity with which you are now living your life is unconscionable to me. Like I cannot live with you. I couldn't imagine having kids with you. Um, I couldn't imagine traveling with you and, in and enjoying it at all. Like your food needs are so um, enormous mm -hmm. and um, inflexible that they, in my opinion, make you impossible to live with. Like I don't want any part of it. And he said, I get that it's working for you. I get that you're happy and you know, that you're thin now, but this is off the hook. And, um, you know, I later had to look at that and go, you know, I think he's right. You know, like when I told him that, that the program was explicit about program family job, right? Like your husband's birthday is on a committed meeting night. Ask him if he'll celebrate a different, a different night. Interesting. Wow. I, Usually yeah. it's God family job. <laughs> Yeah, well, they would say God slash program are the same thing. I don't yeah. know what they would say. I'm not speaking for No, them. no, no, no. Yeah, I, yeah. Not. Just, just my context. I've never right. heard totally. that order before. Yeah. Totally. And like, um, so here I was in, in, this brings us now up to January of 2014. I was in that program and I was working it. And it was, I found my little corner of it where I was, you know, I had a sponsor that wasn't, you know, too crazy and it was going okay. Um, and in the meantime, I'd become a tenured psychology professor and I was teaching a college course on the psychology of eating and the neuroscience of food addiction. So my academic trajectory was that I, I graduated from UC Berkeley. I got into every graduate school I applied to. Um, I moved to, to Rochester, New York to, to get my PhD in brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester, did that. Um, and then I moved to Australia, Sydney, uh, to get a two year postdoc in psychology, did that. And then I got several tenure track job offers, but my husband really had found a job that he wanted to keep in Rochester. So um, I started teaching at Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. And I got tenure there. I was there for almost a decade. Diamond in the rough. Nine years or something. Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, we had three daughters during that time and it, yeah. it, it worked. You know, I was able to be a mom and teach my classes. And um, we had an adjunct who um, developed this course on the psychology of eating and then up and left for Kansas, like three weeks before the semester started. And um, the class scheduler came to me, low person on the totem pole and said, will you teach this course? And I said, why, yes. <laughs> um, of course I will. Of course I will. And um, he's like, good, she's left all her materials. So it shouldn't be too hard. And um, I, I, I devoured all her materials. And I was like, wait a second, she's got no unit on the neuroscience of food addiction. That was like my pet hobby up till that point. Like, yeah, I love that because I'm big on the neuroscience of addiction fundamentally. Totally. totally. And she was very much from the like mindful eating, competent eating, 
um, never been overweight in her life, no clue what someone with food addiction grapples with. She was an eating disorder specialist, which meant she was very big on the, there are no bad foods. And, um, you know, someone with an eating disorder background needs to like learn to not pathologize food, just eat healthfully, listen to their body. That works for some people, but I'm actually in touch with one of the world's experts on eating disorder treatment. And in her, her opinion, it's not working for a lot of people because the sugar and the flour that they're asking people with bulimia and anorexia to like, you know, accept as normal food, like it's not normal food. Our food supply is not normal. Yep. Almost nothing is normal these days. <laughs> right. right? With, with the food industry. It's all marketed very well for it to look normal and be healthy. Yeah, it's Franken food. It's like, mm -hmm. oh. So anyway, um, yeah, I retooled the curriculum of that course. Like I just chopped it up. I learned a lot though. Like it was really helpful to learn the science of what I would consider to be the other side. Like, for example, it's really important to know the science of dieting because dieting is incredibly detrimental physiologically and to the brain. Um, and the backlash from it is real. So we're treading a really delicate line when we try to help people regain authorship of their eating. Especially That's a big theme though these days is dieting. Oh, totally. And it's, yeah. And you know what we're doing at Brightline Eating is we're breaking the mold. Like we're completely doing it differently. So what I can show people is, look, here's a white paper. It's published online. You can just Google it if you want. It's um, uh, likelihood of an obese person achieving a normal weight with Brightline Eating within one year. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and Google that. There's a white paper that we've got up online and it shows our data. And what it shows is that someone who is obese, like at a BMI that's obese, class one, class two, or class three. So any class of obesity today, who starts the Brightline Eating Bootcamp and answers surveys for one year, just by doing those two actions, puts themselves in a population of people, in a, in a, a sample of people who are 55 times more likely to be in a right sized body, like a normal BMI within one year than if they do anything else with that year. So repeat that. Yeah. Someone who's obese today and does the Brightline Eating Bootcamp is 55 times more likely to be in a right sized body in one year than if they do anything else. Hmm. 55 times more likely. So. so I bring that up in the dieting discussion because it's like, well, we have a solution now and we have data to prove it. So the like diets don't work thing only makes sense in a context of a world that used to exist four years ago where there was no solution. Okay. So, so we want to make a distinction between dieting and fasting. Fasting? Yeah. Is there, is there a difference? Because I think dieting is such, it, it just, I don't even know what it means anymore because there are so many programs out there about dieting. It just right. usually means less food or suffering or, you know, <laughs> something around that, right? <laughs> suffering. I'm dieting. I'm dieting. I'm eating great food. Well, they're always suffering. You see them at the restaurant and yeah, like, not eating when everybody else is like, ah, I'm sorry, I'm on a diet. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're sorry. Good job. I'm eating 100 calorie packets of crackers. No, and I know that's important, but um, not important, yeah. so right before we got on, yeah, I, and I'm kind of like, I'm blowing myself up here because I'm showing how, how like kind of my perspective on things, which is probably not, not good and not accurate, but you did a video on, um, I think, um, on, on eating out less, right? You, may, you, you challenged yourself to eat out less and you okay. asked for accountability three months later. And so that's, that's, that's where my headspace is coming from here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, dieting and fasting are completely different. And, and, and in general, the difference between um, the right way to eat and a diet is really just a few little tweaks, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so um, given our current food environment, we want to be doing something other than the mainstream. Because yes. just eating mindlessly the way everyone out there kind of does standardly leads to obesity and early death with a lot of painful complications between now and yes. then. So, um, so 
dieting is right in one sense, which is I got to get off that mainstream train, right? Okay. That's not healthy. Can we all just agree on that? Yes. Like, that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. So should we be eating less? Yes, we should. We're eating too many calories overall, and that's a problem. Um, there's very good research on that. Um, calories do matter. A calorie is not a calorie, but calories do matter, and we're eating too many of them. Mm -hmm. There's lots of reasons for that. Um, probably just the, the yumminess and the uber availability of the food is, you know, a clear reason, right? And the large portion sizes and the fact that we're eating half of our food outside the home now instead of in the home and the big plates and the, all that is a factor. Can I but, tell you a funny story yeah, just yeah. real quick? My son just got back from a two-year Christian service mission in Benin, Africa. Benin, uh -huh. Togo. And the first restaurant we took him to was Cheesecake Factory. And he sat there and he got a plate of food. He sat there and he, he looked literally ill and disgusted because he was like, this is enough food for a family for two days just on my plate, you know, in terms of what they eat. So yeah, it's, it was, it was eye opening. Totally. Oh my goodness. What a great story. Yeah. Okay. So the diet thing. It's a good question. I've actually never broken this down before. I never even, I should, I should remember what I'm saying here because I should shoot a vlog on this, but um, yeah, so we need to be eating less. We need to get off the standard train. Um, where a diet is off is that it implies, it doesn't state it, but it implies that it's short term, that you're going to do it and then you're going to kind of go back to regular and that's off, right? So we don't need a diet. We need a lifestyle change. That's kind of a jargony you know, fashionable thing to say. I don't know that people really have thought about that really deeply. Like, what does it mean to do a lifestyle change, right? And I have some thoughts about that. It, what it means is that you change your identity at the mm -hmm. deepest level. Like, you become someone who eats a different way. Like, I don't eat sugar and flour. It's part of my identity. Um, I eat three meals a day. I don't graze. I don't snack. That's an identity thing. I do bright line eating. And it's in the same way that, like, my husband golfs. <laughs> <laughs> it's just part of who he is. Yeah. Bright line eating. It's like it's part of my being, or like my husband loves dogs, or whatever, right? Like, you know, like someone is a dog person. Yeah, I'm a bright lifer. I do bright line eating. So when something is sunk down into your identity, you know it because the cookies get passed around, and you don't say, Oh, I can't have that. That's what someone who's on a diet would say. I can't have that. It's not on my diet. Right. I, no thanks. I don't eat sugar, and I pass the plate. Huh. I, said, I can't. I don't. Right. I don't eat that stuff. I'm a human. I'm a person who doesn't eat that. It's more like becoming a vegetarian, right? When someone becomes a vegetarian, they're not on a diet. It's an identity shift. They're changing the way they eat for certain deeply held reasons, whatever they are. That's, that's one of the differences is short term, long term, base grounded in identity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, finally, kind of like the difference between dating and getting married. Yeah. <laughs> in yeah, my mind. That. That's, yeah. that's how I can relate. To it. Yeah. Are you in? <laughs> like, you know, are you in or are you like testing the waters? Yeah, right. totally. Um, yeah. And although dating has a certain relationship to getting married, right? It's like en route. Mm. Whereas dieting almost has the opposite. It's like, it's like, a, it's like going on vacation. For mm -hmm. most people, dieting is like, I'm visiting here, but I know I'm not staying. And they're doing it because they're going on vacation. <laughs> right, totally. <laughs> well, that's, that's another big difference. Like, you know you're on a diet when you're thinking, well, I can't stay on it now because it's my birthday. It's my husband's birthday. It's the holidays. I'm going on a cruise. It's the 4th of July. It's Valentine's Day. My neighbors are having a dinner party. My mom is having a dinner party. It's my, it's my you know... Like if you add up all of the reasons to not stick with your diet or your food plan, just think about the life of like yo-yoing that you're setting yourself up for, of like trying and resuming. And then, and then the way you're setting yourself up to like basically be someone who's continuously, chronically falling off the wagon and then trying to resume. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if it's an identity thing, like, like a vegetarian who doesn't eat turkey even on Thanksgiving, you are in a whole different ballgame. It's like, the question is not, well, when can I really fit this in, this diet thing, because I've got so many, you know, holidays with special occasions on the calendar. It's more the question of, 
okay, this is what I do now. So how am I going to get through that cruise? How am I going to get through the holidays? Because I don't make exceptions, right? Mm -hmm. Like Thanksgiving is not a gorge fest for me. It's a Thursday, you know, and I eat my three meals and I'm the one who's still like cogent and feeling pretty darn good at 7 p.m. when everybody else is like, yeah, dead. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, anyway, so. Okay. So what do you, what do you do if, if, you know, there are a lot of people who are listening who are transitioning from one addiction to food or one addiction to sugar and you know, there's, oh. Right. There's trauma involved. You have, yeah. you have the brain that's battling you and all the chemical, the chemical and the neurons and the transmitters and, you know, all that your body and your brain are driving you. It's, you know, it's, it's for a lot of people, mindfulness is a big part of it, but there isn't just one pill that you swallow to, to, to win this battle. Right. No. So how is bright line structured to take all that into consideration? Yeah, and let me just say that like as an addict, I identify as an addict, I have been hopelessly, pathologically, probably fatally in most cases addicted to crystal meth, alcohol, cocaine, crack cocaine, cigarettes, caffeine, men, a little bit of gambling, and food. And um, food is the hardest. Like... By far, by far, by far, hmm. it was, it's so much harder than crack cocaine, it boggles the mind. Just saying. Hmm. Now, that's not everybody's story, and I'm certainly not diminishing anyone's experience who's relapsing on the sure. pipe and struggling with it. I'm just saying, like, it's, I think it's harder. It's harder in so many ways. It's harder because complete, perfect, total abstinence is, um, it's, it's really more, an issue of definition and interpretation, even when you're clear with your definitions, there's still more boundaries that, that seem fuzzy and that then need to be thought through, which constantly puts you in a state of, am I really clean? Which for me as a recovering crack addict, I'm never wondering, am I really clean off that pipe? Yes, I am. <laughs> I haven't had mm -hmm. a joke of that, you know, dragon's breath for 24 years. Super clear on that. With food, it's a little bit, even, even though I know what my food plan is, I don't eat sugar, I don't eat flour, I weigh and measure my food, so I'm super clear, four ounces. So yes, Eric, there's a whole system that goes into it. And honestly, for me, like I'd worked the 12 steps, you know, five times in five different 12 step programs before I got the food recovery that I have now. And, you know, to be quite honest now, and now I've worked the 12 steps 13 times in five different 12 step programs. And um, to take the food thing lightly is like folly. It's folly and it's hubris. Like uh, it takes a, a very um, concentrated, deliberate system that works on many fronts woven together in a really tight net to catch you because um, the food thing is hard. And I see a lot of people underselling um what it takes because they think oh it's just food you know at least i'm not drinking anymore you know or whatever and it's like oh <laughs> no it's the opposite it's like oh it's food food is the hardest yeah i mean it's just damaging as many of you know the, the alcohol the drugs the cigarettes if it's not done properly well, 63% of us are dying prematurely from it. And, you know, 75% of us are suffering from it, like overweight or obese, joints are hurting, on medications they don't need to be on, uh, ticking time bombs with their health. They know that, you know, their triglycerides are too high and their blood sugar is not as, you know, stable as it used to be. And, you know, all that stuff, the stuff that we accept as normal now some cognitive de decline, not remembering names as well as I used to, my joints hurt, I, I, you know, I really don't love riding bikes anymore, or, you know, it's really hard to get up off the floor when I play with my kids, my grandkids, like all the stuff that we just kind of accept now in a society, I don't know if you know this, but we passed 40% obesity in the United States recently. No way. Uh, it used to be a third, now it's 40%, and then 75% overweight or obese, like if you add it all up. So, well, and how many more kids have diabetes so early now, too? Right. 
And, you know, if I, I've got three daughters, you know, statistically, one in three of them will get diabetes, statistically, have diabetes early enough that they're going to be sitting ducks for blindness and leg amputation. Hmm. Yeah. So how do, uh, tell me, what is, what is, what is the definition of a bright line? Yeah. Uh, so bright lines are, uh, it's a legal term, actually, that's been co-opted by psychologists. Um, to sort of conceptualize this notion of a clear boundary that you just don't cross that helps you in your sort of um, in situations of temptation. So the idea is if you're going to be the designated driver for a party, you're going to be way more successful if you go into that party thinking, I have a bright line tonight for alcohol. I'm not going to drink no matter what, just tonight because I'm the designated driver. Then if you think I'm going to be sure to drink moderately so I'm safe to drive by the time it's time to go home that's not a bright line. It's a fuzzy boundary. You never know which side of it you're on exactly. Have you be, been sure to drink moderately enough? <laughs> yeah, no. that's pretty wide open. <laughs> totally. So, so that's what a bright line is. And the four bright lines for food are um, in bright line eating are sugar, flour, meals, and quantities. Um, okay. And then, you know, we put it together into a food plan that is super clear so you know what you're eating and... Um, <laughs> starts to get really simple and clear. Yeah. So give me an example of, um, so let's say somebody is listening and they're saying, I'm really intrigued by the bright lines. What are some of the first steps that they need to start thinking about um, in terms of their commitment level to something like this? Yeah, I would say the commitment level needs to be pretty high. Uh, sometimes I get the question of like, how do I psych myself into it? Or how do I convince my daughter that she needs to do it? Or blah, blah, blah. And I'm always like, oh no. Like, I'm not in the convincing business. I'm here to help the people who are like, Susan, I'd give anything for a solution to this food thing. Just tell me what to do. And I'm like, oh, come with me, sweetheart. You know, but really, um, it takes a fairly high level of commitment because the food is hard. It's like it's out there and society is like this current and you're going to become basically a salmon swimming upstream. Yeah. And and what that means is it's sort of like you're going to have to orient toward doing your food differently than society um, predisposes you to want to do because it's so much easier to just eat out of vending machines and drive throughs and, you know, to eat half of your calories outside of the home prepared by someone else. It's not the way to get what we call happy, thin and free, right? It's not the yeah. way. So it's back to that old saying, you want what you've always, you know, gotten, you're going to keep doing what you always did. You want something new, you're going to have to really do something new. So the, the motivation bar needs to be pretty high in my experience. The good news is um, I hated to be fat. Lots of people hate being fat. Um, and lots of people hate all the things that go with overeating, like the joint pain and the medications and the worsening memory and the low self-esteem and all that. So once you're sure you want to change, come to me and we got you covered, but I'm not in the mix of like helping you get sure. Like that's on you. Go do that by yourself. Right. Okay. <laughs> so <really harsh. laughs> no, that's great. You know, and, and it's, there's, you have to be committed to this. And I was thinking yeah. when I was talking, thinking about talking to you is you can really establish bright, bright lines for almost any addiction, right? Oh, yeah. It's helpful to think them through too, totally. Like, so for example, where's my phone? It's, uh, it's over there somewhere, but I got bright lines for my cell phone use. Like, for example, I don't bring my cell phone upstairs at the end of the day. My cell phone stays downstairs. So when I go upstairs to kiss my kids good night, my phone is plugged in down here in this very room. This is, I'm downstairs in my house. My bedroom is upstairs. My kid's bedroom is upstairs and the cell phone doesn't come upstairs with me. Okay. And so your bright line, your motivation for that bright line is what? It's, it's um, partially to let my nervous system let down off that technology. So I'm not checking. It's also to make sure that I have some quality time with my kids without my cell phone in the mix. And it's also to get my brain and body away from the EMFs, the waves of that cell phone overnight so that the phone is not in my bedroom with me. Mm -hmm. So is there, how do you, is it important to establish a relationship between your personal motivation um, for sticking to the bright line or, because I, I guess you said you have to figure out your desire and your motivation, right? Yeah. And, uh, I guess I'm kind of leaping back into how do you establish a motivation pool? 
because I think that's where a lot of people, how, how did it work for you? Or is there, if you were to give advice, and I know this, they have to be ready by the time they jump into Brightline's program, but yeah. how, do, how do people think through that? You know what, you know, even given what I said, um, I, I have some nuance, there's nuance to it, which is yeah. um, you can start Brightline eating, not at all sure it's gonna work for you. I don't care about that at all, actually. Like, I think at the, at the point at which someone would come to me, the, the, um, the odds that they would feel pretty skeptical and defeated and like uncertain are really high. Like if you're feeling scared and like this probably won't work for me because nothing does, like that's fine. Like you're, you're mine. Come on, baby. We'll, we'll, we'll get you sorted. Um, and you don't even have to like um, really be sure yet if you're willing to like start, right? Yeah. Like just give me a day. Sign up for the boot camp. Then you got a 30 day, 100% money back guarantee period. So, you know, you got 30 days to decide. Just do it for a day. At the end of the day, say, do I feel like doing it for another? Right? Give me 30 days. And then if you're like, oh, this is awful, then it's like, oh, just write into my team and we'll give you all your money back right away. No questions asked. Easy. So um, I, think, I think the main um, orientation that leads to success and the advice that I would give is just come in surrendered or pretend you're surrendered, right? Just like, give me your, give me your hands. Let me put the handcuffs on them. Let me just lead you away. Right. And just say, <laughs> you, you get no more say over your food life for 30 days. You know, let me take control. Just trust me. Just trust me. It's going to be, you might be like, really? I got to do It'll that. Be fine. But you know, and then, and then in 30 days, I'll give you your car keys back and your street clothes. And if you want your wallet, and your cell phone, if you want out, you, you just go on your merry way, but just get, just give me a little bit. Right. <laughs> okay. How, how did, <laughs> I've got this image in my mind of what you just walked through. <laughs> totally. It's I don't fabulous. know where I come up with this stuff. It's I've never fabulous. said anything like yeah. this before. It's I've got to memorable. send this link out to my tribe because uh, my interviews are often kind of stock and this one's not. So that's fun. <laughs> Good. Um, so is it, so if you're thinking in the context of a family, right, um, yeah. a mom who is doing good, but a teenager, you know, who is struggling or a husband who is struggling, what is the best approach there? Um, I've heard often that even with everybody has an addiction to something, right? Um, and, and that was pointed out to me. If you've ever thought about it, if you love Diet Coke, you've ever thought about quitting Diet Coke, how hard was that, right? Did you ever quit? I disagree. And the research is in stark contradiction to what you just said. Not everybody is addicted to something. Okay. So how do we help? How do we help? No, that's fine. So I guess my point was there trying to establish some sort of, some level of empathy. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Because it's hard for people to understand. So you're nodding your head back and forth. If you're just well, listening to the audio. I think the reason it's hard for people to understand is because they don't have addiction. Like they, they don't ever hurt themselves wanting to stop and not being able to like, like yeah. how hard is it for you to quit hurt the, you know, quit the diet coke? Okay, maybe. But like, are you drinking 28 of them a day? And are you like mm -hmm. unable to walk upstairs because of the, you know, um, the aspartame um, toxicity in your joints? Mm -hmm. And as you're sitting at the bottom of the stairs, you're downing one more diet coke saying, God, I miss the upstairs of my house, but maybe next week I'll quit the diet coke. Like, so mm. I was trying to paint a story of what diet Coke addiction that matches anything like yeah. what I've been through an addiction um, is like, and you got to get pretty extreme to make that match. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't agree that everyone's addicted to something. And as a matter of fact, one third of brains are not constitutionally capable of being addicted to anything. They don't want to To the level that I saw a lot of my friends and family get addicted. Mine was not. And, and so for whatever reason, I got dealt that card. There's a continuum. Um, There's a continuum. And, yeah. you know, on a scale from one to 10, and this is something I, I have a quiz that people can take on food addiction. There's mm -hmm. a continuum from one to 10. Maybe you're a four, Eric. I don't know your story really, right? I'm a 10. Yeah. Um, but, but the brains of people who are ones and twos and threes, they don't experience addiction. Like my husband's a three and he looks at me and, and the way I hurt myself with my addiction sometimes. And he's like, yeah. why would you do that? Like, why would you pick that up and then keep using it 
knowing clearly what it does to you. He can't fathom. He never does it, ever. So it's really behavior regardless of the consequence, right? And a desire to stop. Like a desire to stop. Tears streaming down your face. That's just... Why am I doing this? Another pint of ice cream? Really? And you're crying. And you're Mm -hmm. going, it doesn't even taste good anymore. Like, that's what I would call addiction. Okay. And you can do bright line eating without being a food addict or having ever done that. And it will still help and get your weight off yeah. and all that. But that's addiction. It's mm. like hurting yourself consciously, not wanting to, not knowing why you're doing it and not being able to stop. And not everybody experiences that. Yeah. All right. So help me, help me kind of reel in my point then. I guess my point was um, really at the end of the day, of the day if you have a loved one yeah does going through it does going through bright lines with them okay help. so, okay. so my, my point was you know instead of saying you go do it go do this and prescribing it's like right. hey let me do this with you kind of approach okay so a few things here it's really important how smart you are you're super smart <laughs> Uh, I love ideas. Like I so geek out on ideas yeah. and concepts and it's all like, I hold it all lightly, right? It's all up for. Yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. Um, okay. So I have a, I have concerns with the framing of what you just said already. Like I think okay. it's really important in families where addiction is in play for everybody to keep their eyes on their own plate. Um, it's sort of like codependency 101, right? Like don't go, thinking that you're gonna like sit by your spouse every night in the AA meeting, right? Like they need to kind of go or not go and it's on them. Like their mm-hmm. recovery is on them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and your job as the person other than the alcoholic is to like go to Al-Anon and learn how to be happy whether they quit drinking or not, basically, right? Mm-hmm. So same thing applies to food. Keep your eyes on your own plate, right? Like if a family member is expressing a desire to do bright line eating, I think it'd be great then to, you know, make sure there's money in the budget for them to sign up for the boot camp. And there's a friends and family video that's one of the bonuses in the boot camp that will explain to the other people in the household and their friends and so forth, how can you best support this person? And there are things like, yeah, don't keep your Doritos on the counter. Would you roll up that bag and put them in a cupboard and maybe you can like even negotiate here, this is my cupboard for my snack foods that you don't need anymore so that they're out of sight, out of mind for you. Or even if you want to be, go a step further and say, look, for the next few months, I'm not going to eat those foods in the house. If I want to go eat something, I'll go out, I'll I'll consume it out of the house. I'll come home with the crumbs wiped off my face, right? (laughs) Like you can be helpful like that, right? Um, you can learn the whys of like, why is this person not drinking alcohol anymore? Oh, because alcohol is sugar. Why is, it, why is it important that this person eat three meals a day? Why is it helpful for me to make sure that, that dinner doesn't happen at 9 p.m. when they've had lunch at noon? You know, because they might be a little hangry by 9 p.m. because they're not snacking anymore, right? Little things like that. But basically, they need to do, go do bright line eating on their own. I don't think bright line eating is really appropriate for parents to, to get kids to do. Um, and I get that it's heartbreaking when our kids are overweight. I have another book that I recommend that parents read um, uh, and, and um, taking away their sugar and flour is not appropriate in my what, opinion. What is that book? It's called Your Child's Weight, Helping Without Harming. And it's by Ellen Satter, E-L-L-Y-N Satter, S-A-T-T-E-R. But she doesn't believe in food addiction. So don't listen to anything she does, says about adult eating. Her book is really as a method of feeding kids only. And it's a good like codependency 101 book. It's like, it, it talks about a division of responsibility. Your job as a parent is to provide meals at regular intervals, foods that you feel good about serving, and then you're hands off about whether or how much they eat from what you provide. That's their job. Your job is providing food. Their job is eating food. Don't get messed up in their job. Don't start talking about, oh, you got to eat your vegetables or take a bite of everything or finish what's on your plate or all those old school rules, throw them all out. You provide the food, you put it on the table. They're not hungry. That's their business. But there's not food until the next snack or meal and snacks are sit down meals basically. So kids need meals and snacks, but it's sit down and and a parent who's doing bright line eating is going to be way ahead of the game in that whole system because they're going to be actually eating meals themselves. Americans have, and other cultures too, but mostly Americans have really stopped eating meals. Like it's a silly thing yeah. that we just don't do anymore. But 
um, meals are important and, and for kids, they're important too. So um, anyway, that's, that's the, the family thing. Bright line eating is pretty easy to do if you're sort of a, a provider of food for a family and they're not doing it. Because what you do is it's like basic categories of food. It's like you're going to eat for dinner. You're going to eat vegetable, protein, salad. And then if you're still on the weight loss plan, you're not at maintenance yet, that's all you're going to eat, protein, vegetable, salad. But then you add a big pot of starch, like make a big pot of pasta or a big pot of rice or whatever, throw some bread and butter on the table and some salad dressing and like everybody's good to go. Like that's a meal, cut up an apple, whatever, right? So you could just add a couple things to it and you've got a meal for any family. So um, no short order cooking. That's a bad habit that we get into with kids that Ellen Satter says, don't do that. So um, just serve the food and they get to choose and they say, but I don't like this. You say, well, then don't eat it. And if you're true to your word and you don't force them to eat anything, they got nothing to say to that, right? Yeah. I don't like this. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> I'm not making you eat anything. Um, yeah. That's great. How, how do we, why are there so many, uh, so you, you say that she doesn't believe in food addiction yet she's talking about this. How is that possible in my mind? How do we all get on the same page here? Like what, I mean, we're in an age of science and data now. I know. Doesn't the okay. science, I mean, can't, how do we all get on the same page? Okay, Seriously. I don't know uh, how we all get on the same page, but I will tell, uh, how do I put this? I have no say over the page that anyone else is on. <laughs> yeah. So I have nothing to say about how we all get on the same page, but what I can do is provide some illumination about why we're on different pages. And then the discerning watcher can go, oh, that person who's saying that there's no food addiction, now I know why. So here's the deal. There are two camps. There's people who talk about food addiction like a thing. And then there's people who say, there's no such thing as food addiction. And the people who talk about food addiction as a thing are scientists all the scientists who study addiction in the brain say there's food addiction because it's real simple. You look at the brain and there it is. Yeah. Addiction centers are right here. Dopamine down regulation happens. It looks just like heroin addiction, just like cocaine addiction. It's the same circuitry. There it is right there. That's food addiction. Now there are people who are educated to help people with food issues. They get degrees in counseling for bulimia and anorexia and things like that. And in that world, the training that they get in graduate school is that it's very important that the eating disordered individual lets go of their notion that there's good foods and bad foods. And we need to normalize all foods. Mm -hmm. And so the concept of food addiction where certain foods are addictive and others aren't is very threatening to that paradigm. And they're entrenched in thinking that food addiction doesn't make sense. And they say things like, that doesn't make sense. It's like being addicted to air. It's like being addicted to water. We need food to live. Well, yes, we do. <laughs> but these Franken foods we have in our environment are produced just like drugs. We're taking the inner essence of plants and refining and purifying them yeah. into white powders. That's exactly how we make heroin. It's exactly how we make cocaine. We extract that inner essence and we purify it down. We are turning our food supply into uh, a, a drug factory basically with sugar and flour and if you look at what a drug is that's what it is it's the inner essence of, of a plant refined and purified into a fine white powder and then delivered um coca leaves are not addictive poppies are not addictive but co cocaine and heroin are uh sugar and flour are it's not debatable from a scientific perspective but from a worldview perspective it's debatable um so anyway, that's where the controversy exists and that's why we're not on the same page. How do we all get on the same page? It might happen eventually when the stakes get high enough. Like, okay, now 75% of us are overweight or obese. Like, what's it gonna take? I don't know, you know, but um, when my numbers look better than their numbers. Yeah, that's such a long, I'm trying to stop from diving into that one because that's, I, that's, I really, I'm passionate about that and I think there's um yeah the food industry it's it's kind of the 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 camps of psychology versus biology right yeah kind of kind of I mean treatment right the counseling psychology of treatment has believed a certain thing 
is helpful for bulimics and anorexics. And for some, for some of them it is. Um, by and large, you know, um, those folks are not educated all at all about the neuroscience of addiction. They don't yeah. know about right? Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's pretty, I mean, the science is there, but it's coming out in such volumes now that yeah. it's really actually pretty new science. And, and if you're not tuned into it and not paying attention to it, it's coming out almost every day. Yeah. Um, I mean, Harvard and all the Ivy League schools are, are doing studies just on, I mean, they're proving mindfulness, they're proving meditation, totally. they're proving all this stuff. So, totally. yeah, we yeah, should be at a day where... Um, scale now, you know, and their numbers are just like our numbers. We have the susceptibility quiz, there's the ill food addiction scale, and they both show that about 20% of society is like they're hardcore full-blown food addicts. Um, well, if, if you look historically a decade ago, we didn't think opiates were addictive. Right. No, opiates were a treatment for alcoholism. Yeah. <laughs> a century yeah, ago. And doctors were letting their patients suffer needlessly. <laughs> yeah, totally. They, it was in the like, the Sears and Robux catalog, right? That big that catalog, like the little, the, open, the heroin inject, you know, so if you have alcoholism, just inject yourself with this wonderful heroin and you'll be all cured. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, the time is, is getting close to being spent and I want to respect your time. I've had a, such a great time talking to you. It's been so fun and oh, I would so love fun. to do this again on some other topics. And thank you for putting my, me in my place on a couple of things, um, which was uh, really important. Any, any last parting words? <sighs> Well, I'm just grateful that you're doing this summit, Eric. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. I think that community around topics of addiction and those who support and love addicts um, is it's it's just so crucial because in Bright Line Eating, what we really have, my husband and I are sort of the co, whatever. Uh, you know, what 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 we really have in Bright Line Eating is a community. Is what we mm -hmm. really have. We do community really well. We support people at that level really well. And I know your heart. I know that that's your intention with the summit is to bring together people right. um, who have a similar experience. Um, and I guess I want to expand what I said earlier around like if you, if you haven't really had addiction, you don't know. But it goes the other way too. If you haven't lived with an addict or loved an mm. addict, you don't know, right? What it is to watch someone. It blows someone up your life. life. Yeah. So it's so important that we have community around this stuff, you know, and um, I just honor what you're doing and I'm really grateful. Oh, to be a part of it. That's very sweet. Thank you, Susan. You mean a lot to me and you're changing a lot of lives and you're impacting a lot of lives and you're doing everything right. And um, I know that you struggle with this every day, day in and day out. So you're talking from uh, a, a position of uh, empathy and experience and, um, I think that's why you're doing so well, um, because people know people who they can trust and you can be trusted. So thank you for doing what you do. Thanks, Eric. So much love. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.